Kulabnaka and welcome to For the Record. The Fiji First Government has delivered its second budget after the elections of 2014. Finance Minister A.S. Sayed Kayum delivered the budget address in Parliament on Friday and already it's being hailed as a people's budget. There are many initiatives that have been announced and over the next weeks and months people will be absorbing everything that's in the budget and how it impacts their daily lives. But tonight we have the Finance Minister himself with us in studio to talk about some of the initiatives and the overall objectives of the government in the 2016 budget. Mr. Sayed Kim, thank you very much for being with us. I understand it's been a busy few uh, days and weeks for you, but getting into it, the value added tax slashing from 15 to 9 percent is the talk of the country. Everybody's surprised, but pleasantly so. Uh, what was the overall objective in deciding that Fiji was ready for a reduction in, in uh, VAT, the main revenue earner for the government, mind you? I think there, there are two uh, fundamental reasons. Uh, well, the first fundamental reason is because the economy has been growing and because the Fiji First Government has a commitment, you know, as has been said by our Prime Minister right since 2007, that we want to create a society that is a lot more equal, equal uh, opportunity uh, for everybody to participate in the economy and also in the socio-economic fabric of our society. So we're always looking at ways of how to assist people. So that has been the sort of driving force behind it. The second driving force behind it, of course, is that we need, when you have a taxation system, it needs to be uh, applied in an even form. It should not be distorted. Because if it's distorted, then it can become regressive. In other words, the people who should be paying more or the people who should be paying less, are, it's not actually happening. So that's one particular reason. And the distortions also means that we're losing revenue. It also means that we are unable to assist people a lot, lot more. So the economy has grown. Uh, quite, uh, you know, on a consistent and regular basis over the past three to four years. The economy grew by in excess of 5%, only the seventh time in our history. And the IMF has also predicted that the Fijian economy is doing quite well. In fact, their projection of the Fijian economy is a lot more positive than ours. Uh, and that is the first time. So we've also been looking over the past, you know, uh, year or so, in fact, even before the election, we've been looking at how we can adjust things and how we can make things happen. So it's a long uh, thought out vision, a long term goal. So we saw the capacity where we can actually reduce that. Uh, as you know that there has been about six items uh, that where there's at the moment there's no uh, application of VAT. What some people call basic food items, but they're not actually basic food items. Those items are what we call uh, cooking oil, uh, flour, uh, powdered milk, rice, tin fish. Uh, and then we have tea also. So these items don't have VAT and also kerosene, they don't have VAT. Now in this new uh, announcement that we've made, we've said VAT will now also be applicable to those things. But overall the VAT will decrease. So you have a group of items, lots of items, everything in Fiji other than those seven items has got VAT at the moment. Those seven items including kerosene now will have VAT. So they're all on the level playing field. But then we brought the overall level of VAT down for everything. So even though you may now pay 9% more for say flour or rice or tin fish and cooking oil and powdered milk, you in fact will be paying far less or 6% less than everything else. Because when you go and do shopping, you don't just buy those things. You buy potatoes, you buy onion, you buy garlic, you buy butter, you buy washing soap, you buy detergent. You buy mosquito coil, you buy toilet paper, you buy eggs. All these things at the moment is VAT. It'll all come down from 15 to 9%. So 6% drop. So if you put everything in a basket, when you go and do shopping for a normal household, your overall cost, I'm talking just about food, will come down by, uh, your CPI including food, will come down by 4.5%. So, you know, for example, at the moment, a parent who may be spending $200 in the beginning of the year, to buy, say, uh, uh, buy uniforms, to buy spend $200. They will save $12 because the VAT has come down. But in fact, for clothes, it should come down even more because we have zero rated duty on fabric. So by 5% uh, five at the moment, it's come down, by, come down to zero. So in fact, you'll be saving 17%. No, sorry, you'll be saving 6 plus 5, which is 11%. So it's more than $12 you'll be saving. So a number of those areas, we've actually, the VAT has gone down, plus the duty on it has gone down. So 
undergarments for men and women, uh, for children's clothes, uh, to a baby's toiletries, napkins, all of these things, the duty has been made 0%. So now the overall cost of that will come down, plus the VAT you pay will also come down. So in fact, that 4.5% that I mentioned, uh, the reduction overall is not is assuming the tariff rate is not coming down. But if you take into consideration the tariff rate, it's come down even more. So overall, it's good for everybody. And now, you see, the, the problem is when you have a distorted uh, VAT system. So the thinking, you know how you said these six items they had where there was no VAT. They said, oh, uh, previously, they thought, oh, if we don't have VAT, that means the, the person who is not very well off doesn't have to pay VAT. But guess what? A person who's earning $100,000 when he goes into the shop, they also don't pay VAT, but they can afford to pay VAT. So in that way, you have the rich guy being subsidized too. So by having VAT applied to everything, we are in fact creating a level playing field, but having targeted assistance. So for example, now there'll be VAT on medicine, you know, apart from the 700, medicine. So medicine now, obviously, we've been giving free medicine. So if you earn $20,000 less, uh, $20,000 or less a year, you get free medicine. So they don't get affected by the application of VAT on prescribed medicine. Of course, if you're richer, you have to pay VAT on it. So in the free medicine list, for example, this year there's about 71, 72 items. From next year, there'll be 142 items. So diabetes, uh, diabetes tablets, diabetic strips, all of that will now be um, uh, given for free to those people who earn less than $20,000 a year. So overall, the impact has been very positive, and we've been able to do this for a number of reasons. It's because, like I said, VAT is now applied on everything. So you see, we found a lot of supermarkets, they are stealing from the system, because when they have certain goods that has no VAT, and certain goods that has VAT, or most of the goods has VAT, when they're filing their returns, they're able to tweak around with the numbers. So when they get the VAT return, they get more. So by creating this level playing field, we'll be collecting, uh, because of the distortions, $120 million more from the supermarkets and all these people. We'll also, what we'll be doing now is FERCA will going, is going to put in some place some new technology where a lot of the supermarkets will be connected to the cash register. Because we also found that some supermarkets, you know, when you go into the supermarket, mm -hmm. there may be, say, six cash registers. Out of the six, two is unofficial. But you and I don't know. When we walk in, we don't know. They don't declare any of their income from that cash register to FERCA. Only the four they show. So now what we intend to do through FERCA is that we'll connect these cash registers to FERCA's system, through IT system. So every time you punch a sale, you buy $10 worth of goods. FERCA knows these people have sent, sold $10 worth of goods. That's very important to do. A lot of countries do that. We need to move along. The philosophy behind this is this. We want businesses to make money, but don't cheat the system. Do it honestly. Do it honestly. And also, as you would have heard in the uh, budget announcement we made yesterday, was that we're saying, try and change the business model. If, for example, you can still make money by selling a shirt for $25, don't sell it for $50. Sell it for $25, you're making money, because the person walking in, if you sell it for $50, they buy only one. If you sell it for 25, they might buy two or three. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's volume based. So in that way, the ordinary people get to enjoy it. You see, because of this VAT reduction, even things like hardware will become cheaper. You know, your uh, price of fuel will come down. Uh, you know, cabin crackers, mosquito coils, home appliances, TV sets, beds, all these things. Mm. We want people to have a good living. This is why, for example, we reduce the duty on deodorants. Women's, uh, you know, uh, sanitary nappies, or tampons, uh, whatever you call it, all those sort of things, uh, panty shields, all of that will come down because we want people to enjoy their lives. They need to have access to those types of things. So it's a very sort of people-focused budget. We can afford it now because we've been very mamangi with the way that we've been controlling our, our funds. Okay. And with that, uh, Minister, we'll have to pause for a moment. It's time to take a break. We'll be right back. Ulamnaka and welcome back to For the Record. We're speaking with the Finance Minister, Ayaz Sayed Kayum. Um, Minister, the uh, VAT initiative that you've introduced and a number of uh, concessions 
uh, and benefits for the people, but it has an impact on the government's revenue collection. Uh, one of the major incentives for the government uh, is the service turnover tax. Of course, that's going to bring in more money for, for you. But overall, is it enough to balance out the VAT uh, decrease and your commitment to, to uh, uh, improve the lives of Fijians? How do you fund this reduction? Um, we have uh, funded this reduction by way of, as you know, that uh, overall VAT reduction will cost us about 300 million if you look at the decrease in 9%. Then the introduction of VAT on those items that I said did not have VAT before will give us, on the other hand, about $108 million or so. Then we have, as you know, in, uh, increased uh, service turnover tax. A service turnover tax is applicable only if you're going to use the services of, say, of a hotel, you hire a rental car, you're going to use a jet ski, or if you're going to eat at a fancy restaurant that makes more than $1.5 million turnover a year, now $1.25 million a year. Most Fijians don't use that. No. They're going to eat at uh, some food court if they're going out. They're going to eat at a smaller restaurant. Or they don't go and stay at a hotel every day. They don't go and hire a rental car. Uh, they don't go and use a jet ski. So that, that is not applicable to this. It may, it's mainly the tourists or the people who normally go and use those services. Or you may go once a year or you know, mm -hmm. on a holiday, you may stay at a hotel. That's the only time you pay the STT. So we've increased the service turnover tax from 5% to 10%. We've also introduced an environmental levy to essentially to uh, show in particular the tourists and the rest of the world that we are concerned about the environment. So uh, that's how, and we're making about $127.5 million from that. That's how we are funding this loss in revenue from the decrease in VAT. Um, we also expect to make, as I mentioned earlier on, about $120 million in compliance. You know, uh, because of the fact now we've got better on everything, these people will be given less opportunity to steal from the system. We get more money coming in because there's more VAT compliance. And with the linking of cash registers to FERCA, then we'll be able to collect more money. So that's how we are funding it. And overall, if you look at it, uh, from, uh, from memory, the figures we had calculated is about we will be actually making $38 million more on the, on the balance of, or of things. That does not factor in the fact that now when VAT is reduced, people may actually spend more. You know, like I'm saying, somebody saves $12 here, say $3 there, $4, they've got more money in their pocket. So they might say, okay, uh, let's go and buy a bottle of perfume. Or instead of buying, you know, a person who may not be able to buy a new car, a second-hand car, because the car that's cost $20,000 before, obviously is no longer going to cost $20,000 before. I think they'll save about 1200 or uh, thereabouts. There's a reduction in the VAT. So, because people spend more, then we collect more VAT. At a lesser amount, but we'll collect more VAT. So, that amount has not been factored in. So, we're in a very good space. We've looked at all the various permutations. We've been studying it, actually, for the past number of months. Looked at our economic projections. Look at the feedback we've been getting from the international community. And it's been done in a very systematic manner. And we believe it will work. And now, the point is that everybody needs to work together. You need to contribute. We've given you the space spend money, people are supposed to pay taxes, please pay your taxes, and we'll be in a good space. And Fiji can even do more. You know, there are other things that the government has plan planned to do. Mm. You hinted at this in your address, and uh, I suppose it's, uh, it's a worry for, for everyone. The fact that the VAT reduction may not trickle down to uh, ordinary Fijians, some may try to play the system and, and use that VAT reduction to their own advantage. Yeah, so we, this is why we've introduced the law. In fact, uh, if you uh, would have seen after we delivered the budget, I uh, read out a number of what we call consequential laws uh, to introduce, and uh, the opposition would seem to be objecting to it. And, but anyway, we obviously want that those bills to pass next week or the week after next when we meet, because we put in place a law that if uh, a retailer or a shopkeeper or a, car selling, a person selling cars, if they have not reduced the VAT, if they have not reduced the tariff, because we've reduced it, then it's an offense. FERCA can come in, impose a penalty on them. If they don't pay the penalty, we can take them to court and they're liable to go to jail and they can pay even heavier penalties. We've also given more money to the Consumer Council of Fiji to monitor these things. And then as members of the public, and we should be putting out the phone number, the toll-free number that you can call from next week, 
uh, that people can phone in and say, look, I used to go to the shop and they have not reduced VAT because I used to pay $3 before with VAT and now it's supposed to come down by 6% and they have not reduced it. They'll take your call, tell FERCA about it, take all the details and we can charge those people. Unfortunately, we have to do this because we've seen in the past that some people, even when we reduce duty, for example, on other vehicles previously or outboard motor engines or our various other things, the shopkeepers or the people who buy them from overseas, they have not passed it on. We've even seen some businesses who, for example, because you see all businesses, they don't pay VAT. It's only the end user that pays VAT. They can always claim it, you know, the VAT returns. But sometimes, even though they claim it, they'll still add that to their price. Obviously, that cannot happen also. So we have to be very mindful of this. And uh, it's an offense now for them to uh, carry out any such distortions. Mm. Um, when you spoke about uh, supermarkets, um, it seemed that uh, you took it quite aggressively. Well, you have to if they're cheating the system. But moving forward, there has been a new system put in place, and FIRCA is going to get involved with their cash register. Uh, but are you looking at some sort of penalties uh, on the offenses that have been happening uh, over this time, or is it a fresh start? No, it's going forward. I mean, we can't retrospectively apply the law. We can't go back in time. If the new law is going to come into effect, say, next week, then we can't go back in time. It can be only going forward. So with these new changes, we expect them to have, uh, have them applied. Um, it, it's a comprehensive budget. Obviously, we won't be able to cover all of it. But well, the other focus, w when you started uh, your address, you spoke at length about uh, the civil service, the need for reform, and, and the measures that will be coming in, the appointment of new permanent secretaries. Um, uh, to me, it, it sort of seems as if this is a call for civil servants to, um, to step up and, and, and meet the initiatives to implement the policies that the government is trying to set. Uh, is, that, is that the indication? Yeah, I mean, that, that's one uh, particular objective, of course. There are other objectives with the civil service reform is getting, making sure the right ministries are doing the right thing. I mean, one point that we did highlight, and you know, we, we openly acknowledged in the budget address that many of the projects, not many, some ministries are many, some ministries are less, but fundamentally there is a problem with implementation of projects. And the reason being, this is something that's been you know, happening since the Alliance government days, uh, since independence, where we have seen what has developed over the years is that, for example, if we say we'll build three, four new nursing stations or hospitals, the responsibility of that is given to the Ministry of Health. But what is the ministry's core business? The ministry's core business is to provide medical services, They're making sure the doctors are there, making sure the medicine is there. But you have then a number of people involved in Ministry of Health involved in construction. You know, the, what project, how will we design, then they deal with the, a government architect, only the, the government tender board and tenders is out. But they're overall responsible for supervision. They're not the best people to do it in all ministries. You need to have specialized people, people who are trained, who know how to manage it, who know how to focus it, and a lot of it should be outsourced. So we have this old system where even though it's outsourced, the government architect needs to come and approve it. We don't need all of that. You have professional people, the services are available professionally. So what we've said, we're going to centralize construction. So even though the money is allocated to the Ministry of Health to build something new, uh, and fisheries, police, whatever it is, it should be centralized. So it's coordinated, it's outsourced. And then the focus is on those particular projects. The other issue is sometimes ministries come and say, look, you know, we want to build an ice plant on this particular island, or we want to build a police post. The example that I gave was on Benga. So for the past two years, we've been giving the money. It does not get spent. Why? Because they did not even identify the land where it was going to be built, or even secure the lease. So now they have, there's no agreement. And one sort of group of people had said, yes, you can use our land. And after a while, they changed their mind. So it's a bit embarrassing for government, too, when we make these allocations, and it does not get built because, you know, we stand up and say, there'll be a police post built in Banga. But actually, on the ground, something else is happening because when the ministry came to us, they had not secured that land. So we've now made it mandatory for all ministries. Is if you want to build something, make sure you've done the groundwork. And I think what will actually happen now with the centralization of construction work all the scoping and all of that will be done within one particular division within the Ministry of, uh, of Finance. So we leave the Health Ministry, we leave the Fisheries Ministry, we leave Agriculture to get on with the everyday job, you know, look after farmers, 
look after doctors, make sure patients are okay. Not be worried about all these other things, the construction. It needs to be done by a specialized team. So that's one of the key objectives. Okay, and with that, uh, we have to take another quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We'll continue with our discussions. Uh, Minister, during the break, you, you mentioned something. I, I know we've talked about VAT and, and uh, what have you, but let's go back for a second because you said something that, that really uh, stood out about uh, the implementation of VAT, the effect, effective date, date of uh, uh, effect, and the implementation of tariffs and duties. Uh, I understand that Fijians should already be seeing some change in prices as we discussed tonight. Yes, yeah, see what happens by, by law, the VAT, new VAT rate comes into effect from 1 Jan 2016. But tariffs and excise, they immediately get reduced from midnight of um, the 6th of uh, November. So already those items must go down uh, if we have reduced the duty and the excise on that. So for example, like uh, you know, clothes, uh, underpants, um, these are all the stuff that's already on its way. So if something lands you know, tomorrow and it's selling the shops, the duty must come down on those items. Uh, the, uh, uh, for example, you know, downtown duty-free, of course, there's something that needs to be done. But things like clothes, baby garments, all these luxury goods, deodorants, all of these have been affected by a reduction in uh, excise and, and tariffs uh, and, and duty. So they should all come down. Um, and we, what we'll be doing, actually, we'll be publishing a list. There's already a list that's available here. Uh, that's put out by FERCA, so you can see, you know, for example, we've reduced zero-rated duty on sewing machines, uh, uh, buttons, clothes, uh, zippers, all those sort of types of things. Uh, so that duty must come into effect immediately. In the same way, the price of cigarettes would have already gone up. Price of alcohol would have already gone up. What we find is some shopkeepers, they're very good at, uh, wherever there's a price increase, they're very quick at implementing it. Wherever there's a price decrease, they're very slow at implementing it. Uh, well, the, the, the list would be available on the FERCA website if you have access to the Internet on, on your smartphones or at home or your tablets. Uh, also on the Finance Ministry website, uh, I understand it's uh, www.finance.gov.fj. Uh, you can have a look at that, obviously, uh, and, and find out what you can expect in the shops. Speaking of items... Sir, sir can I just add to that? The entire budget figures yes. that we uh, released yesterday each of the ministries, everything is available on the Ministry of Finance website also. All right, and uh, you can obviously have a, have a look at that to have a better understanding of what's in the budget. Uh, you mentioned that items which are already on their way into Fiji will, will be subject to these tariff changes, but a lot of retailers actually say, look, no, we already bought this stock. We already paid for it under the old rates, so we have to get these out of the system, and the next shipment will, will, will have... Uh, yeah, that that, is, that has always been an issue uh, where, you know, they have said that, oh, I bought this whole, even like three months down the track, they said, I've done. But the fact is, it needs to be implemented. Uh, because the fact is, when these duties have gone up, they're very quickly to engage in it. And as the law says, that they all come into effect from midnight. Generally, you'll find that uh, uh, FERCA will now be monitoring that. Uh, it's always been a bit of a gray area. But immediately, as you know, you know, we found that, for example, a lot of people with cigarettes and alcohol, like cigarettes we found, they hold it back. They don't sell it, they, they pull it back. So they wait for the budget announcement. And then as soon as it's announced, then they apply the new rate to it. Uh, so cigarettes and alcohol immediately gets affected. In terms of the uh, goods or items that come in, technically the price needs to come down. Okay, and that's something that people should be mindful of yes, when, they, when they walk into the shops. Absolutely. The health levy that you've introduced on cigarettes, 6%, um, you mentioned it's because you want a health, we want a healthier Fiji, a healthier citizens. What is the overall intent uh, with the additional revenue that, that comes in? Do, is it going to be channeled somewhere? Well, if you see, the Ministry of Health's budget has increased substantially. Uh, we provide for more doctors, uh, more nurses, and also more in uh, purchasing equipment. So that's where you know, the, it's kind of uh, you know, being channeled towards funding other health initiatives. But we also brought down, for example, the duty on many items. Uh, so, for example, also there's no VAT and duty applicable on people with disabilities who require various equipment, you know, hearing aids, uh, prosthetics, you know, joints for their legs, etc. 
uh, wheelchairs, walking aids, all of that is uh, zero rated and also no VAT on it either. Uh, we've also, for example, now increased funding for uh, special schools. Uh, so you see, the, the fact is also when you put it in a uh, health levy, it also demonstrates to the world that we are serious about our health issues and we are concerned about it. The reality is that a lot of people in Fiji are, uh, are getting to be unhealthy. We have also introduced uh, new um, uh, rates on carbonated drinks, you know, things like, uh, you know, those uh, fizzy drinks. Fizzy drinks, yeah. whatever, you know, soft whatever drinks. it is, soft drinks with a lot of sugar in it. Uh, doesn't necessarily have any, you know, nutritional value in it. So those things have all gone up. Uh, on the other hand, also, we have, uh, you know, provided ways of assisting, uh, like I said, special schools. And so we are working towards that. We want to also, um, you know, ensure that uh, we have very good health services. We are behind. There's uh, no denying of that. And one of the reasons why we are behind is because, you see, if you look at most countries, in order to have first-class medical facilities, you need to spend like 20, 30 years of investment. I'll give you an example. In Fiji at the moment, there's nobody available 24-7 that can do an open heart surgery. If somebody has a heart attack, nobody can do an open heart surgery in Fiji. One of the reasons being is that we have not invested right from independence in specialists. You know, if you go overseas, a person who does your open heart surgery, you'll see they would have like 10, 15 years of training. Uh, being a doctor, then they specialize, they go for training and they come back and, they, you know, uh, they, then they can do those types of things. In Fiji, a lot of our good people have migrated or the government has not in previously not invested in these people. So we are obviously investing in these people. As you would have heard, the, one of the announcements we made under the TELS, you know, the education scheme, we've said for postgraduate studies for people who, who are doctors, we'll send them away. But it takes time. So this is why we've put in place a package that if people, <coughs> excuse me, from the private sector want to come and set up hospitals, we'll give them tax holidays, we'll give them tax breaks, various co duty concessions, because we want these private sector people to build hospitals. At the moment, we have a lot of people going away overseas for specialized treatment, or what we call full tertiary care, medical care. If we have private hospitals in Fiji, the first most important thing is that our people, the Fijian people, will be able to access first-class medical facilities in their own country. Okay, uh, I'll have to pause you there for a second, uh, Minister. We have to take a break. We'll be right back. Pulunaka, welcome back. We have with us the Finance Minister, Mr. A.S. Said Kayum, talking about the 2016 budget. Before the break, uh, you were talking about providing uh, high-end care locally. Uh, coupled with that, there's also an initiative for the Fiji National University to have a teaching hospital yeah. in Lotoka. Is that part of these efforts to have uh, tertiary medical care in Fiji? Yes, I mean, but that's a longer term project. But by, as I was saying earlier on before the break, is that if we offer these services, we get full tertiary medical care by private sector coming to Fiji, our people will be able to get medical facilities in Fiji. That's the most important thing. They don't have to go overseas. So the money stays in Fiji. You know, if I have open heart surgery, if I go, off, for example, to India, I can't take my family members with me. It becomes very expensive. But that will be available here. And government is thinking that if a hospital comes and sets up uh, in that fashion, we can have, you know, what we call a, a teaming arrangement. So if you have an open heart surgery, you stay at a private hospital, obviously it's expensive. So you could, they immediately after they have the surgery, they can stay there for, say, two days. Then we can shift them over to the public hospital. Then they get cared, you know, over there. So the cost is less but they will get that surgery done. But once you have good tertiary care also, it means medical tourism can also increase. You know, you'll have people from Australia and New Zealand who can then come and get elective surgeries done in Fiji. People from the rest of the Pacific Island countries can come across too. Retirement villages can be set up. In the past few years, five, six years ago, I remember, we had some Japanese investors who were interested in coming and setting up retirement villages in Fiji. But they said, can you offer full tertiary care? We said, no, we can't. So that opens up those opportunities. We've also given an um, investment package for people who just set up what we call diagnostic centers. You know, we have this issue, we say, okay, we bought one MRI machine. So there's only one MRI machine in Fiji. So if I'm living in Lambasa, Lotoka, it's based in Suva, I have to come all the way there. But if we have somebody that may set up an MRI machine facility with X-ray, you know, uh, CAT scans and what have you, a private person, they can set one up in Lotoka. 
we give them tax incentives as long as the people who run the machines know how to run it we have those kind of facilities available for them too so simply get that done and they can bring it to the doctor and say look these are my results tell me what what do you think of it so we provide incentives for that to make sure that these things happen quickly let's let's uh, look at the economy for a while uh, most of the um, incentives and initiatives that have existed over the years and which apparently have worked given the the level of economic growth are continuing um, we have seen some changes but nothing uh, major that would affect the flow of things at the moment um, are you in a position where you found the right mix to get foreign investors in the, the right incentives and um, of course promoting SMEs small businesses and, and, and micro businesses uh, is this going to continue for the next few years or, or do you foresee a need to uh, make some adjustments going forward well you know our, our uh, suppose focus has always been in creating a business environment that is very friendly and providing incentives that creates jobs for Fijians that's always been our focus and of course get earning the much needed foreign uh, reserves the foreign exchange dollars so that has obviously continued as you know that we, we haven't touched that uh, in the uh, tourism sector we've also then reduced re looked at slip the short life investment packages um, so we were in fact reduced the the ring we ring fenced it now um, because the fact is that the tourism industry whilst they make approximately over 800 million dollars a year uh, in revenue uh, they paid only 8 million dollars worth of taxes last year because they've got all these amazing concessions and normally you give those types of concessions to a sector that is developing you know you you look after it you say okay guys let's come and invest in this area but those concessions actually have been in existing since the 1960s the tourism sector in Fiji now is a very mature sector so we say okay we we've, we've helped you now then let's reduce the concessions you get but for new hotels we ring fenced it and said okay we'll get these types of concessions the areas that we need to give concessions in are for example as i mentioned medical sector we've also uh, offered a new package for private sector people that'll go into building homes affordable homes because that's one area of our focus we want more fijians to own their own homes very important because when you own your own home the self of you know self importance you have dignity you're a lot more secure uh, you're able to use your land for collateral you can get a mortgage if you own the own land or if you have a 99 year lease banks will use it as collateral you can build a nice home it is very good uh, so we are providing that particular focus in the housing sector uh, so we will see private sector company set up affordable housing will give them packages and they can partner up with government because these types of things if you look at overseas in countries like malaysia you know private sector people given the initiative and the incentive and they got into that and more malaysians now have more homes than ever before that is one area of focus we're giving incentive in that area but tourism sector we brought some of the incentives down so um one of the incentives announced was the tax free zone being extended from nosori all the way through the kings highway in tumba of course a uh, uh, very uh, good initiative um, a lot of people can benefit from it but uh, having having the tax free zone and getting people in there to invest uh, is two different things i mean uh, is it do you do you foresee some difficulty in finding people who want to go into these areas possibly for for farming agriculture but um how do you get people to to take advantage of this well, this is the tax free zone is is also applicable to banwa levu tavuni lomaviti lau kandabu all those places are tax free zones on mainland viti levu we've extended previously used to be korovo to tabua we've extended now all the way around sort of some parts of rewa uh, tai levu goes all the way around up to the river at matawalu village uh, just past tedamu if you're coming from the bar side that's where it ends of course the reason why we have tax free zones is because we know there's less economic activity there we want to increase economic activity because when you have less economic activity people from those areas will want to migrate to where there is economic activity and that puts pressure on urban centers etc so people if they don't find jobs in one level they'll come to viti level so they'll uh, won't find land they'll live as squatters that's what we don't want so obviously you need to provide those types of services in those area and we want to get business set up there So the idea is of course to attract them we know that there are a couple of people who are sort of looking at some projects in those areas uh, some people have set up companies in Vanua Levu and they've got the concessions but infrastructure is also very important so this is why you know for example we're doing rural street lighting so you'll see by about May next year you'll see a lot of areas from Suva all the way to Nailanga village in Ba 
with street lights. In the, I'm talking about main rural areas. Like you know, there's a huge area outside Nandi from Koravuto village all the way. You see all these lot of homes past the village, all the way up to the school. They'll all get street lights. When you have street lights, people can sell their sila or their corn at night. If they sell vegetables at night, creates economic activity. If you have electricity, you have good running water. People can say, well, hang on, it's good for me to stay here. I don't mind. I've got all the facilities to stay here. I don't have to move to town. And town's only that, you know, only you know, 20 kilometers away, five kilometers away, and the road is good. So this is the the whole idea of it. And when you have electricity and water, then you attract more people to those areas. So this is the overall plan. So the tax-free zone, of course, has been extended because we recognize, you know, apart from Bar Town, which is very uh, active economically, the other areas right from there all the way up to uh, Nasori, that's what we may call less activity, and we want to get more investment. Okay, and with that, it's the end of another segment. We'll be right back. Pulavinaka, and welcome back. We're about to wrap up the show for this evening, but uh, for the next few minutes, we still have the finance minister with us. Um, minister, the, uh, the Super Rugby game, Crusaders versus Chiefs, had a lot of people cheering. We are a rugby crazy nation. July 1st, everybody's looking forward to it already. But, uh, of course, it's not just a gift for Fiji, is it? There has to be some sort of um, incentive behind it. Well, you know, uh, we were very excited about it. In fact, we've known about this for some weeks now, and we've been negotiating behind the scenes, and we wanted the budget occasion to make the announcement. It is very, very important, you know, uh, because uh, rugby plays a very critical part in our national psyche, in uh, our national uh, nation building. This is when everybody comes together. But it also provides a lot of, uh, uh, you know, employment opportunities for Fijians who play rugby. Uh, it also creates an opportunity for us to be able to use rugby to market our own country. The three sort of particular issues. There's never been a Super 15s game outside the three nations. Although I know Fiji is the first one and they'll be doing it in other countries. The, first, the only time that they went outside the three nations was when there was a massive uh, earthquake in Christchurch. So the Crusaders played a game at Twickenham. Uh, now, so this will be the first time they'll come and play outside. And I know other countries are interested, and they may do deals with them too, like Argentina and, and, and Tokyo. Uh, but the, the fact is that um, we're getting this game. We're paying them. Uh, we are allocated about $2.3 million. So they'll come and see. They'll, uh, they'll come a few days before the actual game, so you know, our local youngsters can go and see them train, maybe have some, you know, uh, some community-based projects around that. And uh, we'll be able to witness the first Super 15 game live played in Fiji at the National Stadium on 1 July. It's, it's fixed at 1 July because they've got the entire schedule worked out for the Super 15's uh, uh, tournament. So we'll get, you know, obviously people coming, the Crusaders fans coming from New Zealand or wherever to watch them, to so boost our tourism. We can do packages around it, come and watch a game in Fiji and have three days off at some resort. Uh, we also, we are saying to the sporting world that, look, Fiji has the capacity to host such an internationally recognized tournament. And so, why don't we have the next All Blacks Australian game played in Fiji? These are the kind of opportunities we are creating. It also will give our youngsters, you know, the opportunity to see with their own very own eyes rather than through television, how, you know, uh, these people play and at that professional level. And it might incentivize other people, you know, to get onto rugby. So I think it's very important. It plays a number of critical roles in terms of promoting Fiji, promoting us as a rugby nation, promoting us as a tourism destination. In the same way, I mean, it probably less prominence as we announced yesterday was we're getting Oceania Swimming Championships in Suva. We're getting the Oceania Weightlifting Championships in Suva. So with the infrastructure that's been built also, you know, a lot of these people, they like to come to a place where the roads are good, everything's working, streetlights working, they have access to uh, McDonald's and various other. You've got Burger King that's opening, uh, good restaurants, uh, it's clean, environment is safe. That's how you promote Fiji. A lot of these countries like Singapore, if you look at Dubai, all of these, that's what they focused on. And Fiji is another destination that we want to promote in that fashion. We are now going to have direct flights to Singapore from next year. So Fiji now, after connecting to Singapore, connects to every single continent that's around the Pacific Rim, except South America. So we're in a good space, and we want to create Fiji more as a hub. 
Mm. Um, Minister, we've come to the end of the show, but very quickly, um, one last question before we go. The government, through the various budgets and this budget again, has set the platform for everyday Fijians, for the average citizen. Uh, what do you want to see from them in return? What we want to see is that firstly, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the business community is that we've also provided incentives for them. Work together with government. Do not steal from the system. Not all of them steal from the system. Many of them are very good. Many of them have invested well in Fiji. We recognize them. We thank them for that. But the others who are rigging the system, stop doing that. We want you to make money, make money. Change your business model. Don't try and make a kill on one sale. If you can sell something for three dollars less and still make a profit, do that because you'll find people will buy more. That's the attitude we need to have. Secondly, to the ordinary Fijians, you also please don't try and rig the system. If we're giving incentives for those people less than twenty, who earn less than twenty thousand dollars, please do that. If you're earning more, don't try and weasel your way into the system. We, by carrying out a good management of the economy, have been able to reduce VAT. Who knows what else we can do if the economy is running well? And to those people, for example, uh, I'm talking about also the unionists. By this, we're actually putting more money into the hands of the workers. We want the workers to also understand that we have a government here that looks after everybody, that cares for everybody. It does not take one extreme to the other extreme. It does not only look after one group. So you also need to be rational. Do not get duped by people who may use you politically uh, just for their own self-interest. Now, we are not saying trade unionists are bad, but we also need to be mindful of the fact that some of these people will use you for your own uh, you know, uh, means, for their own sort of advancement. So be objective about it. Don't get swayed in. Not everything is about this increase in salary. It's about the price of goods. That's also very important. And overall, let's all work together. That's the message that our Honorable Prime Minister has always been saying. We need to all work together as Fijians. The nation is doing well. Let's come together. Let's collaborate. Let's think about what we can do better for the future and, in fact, for the future of our children. Minister, thank you very much for your time. No. No and that was our show for tonight. Remember, for details or comments and questions, you can uh, email us for the record at fpc.com.fj. And as we mentioned, you can get all the copies of the uh, budget address and, and all the documents on the Finance Ministry website, www.finance.gov.fj. That's it from me. Up next is Nemani Indela Mbatiki with his uh, opinion segment. Uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Good night.